If you are in securities lending, repo, collateral management, or prime brokerage, then you know technology is important to your business. You need to watch this video, the second of a two-part interview with Broadridge about the future of securities finance technology. So let's get to it. The, the, the challenge, though, that I see is these are still conceptual things. So if we go back to what I was talking about in terms of the risk people take, you know, the, the, applying AI to multiple tasks, I can see has some value, but there's still, you know, there's going to be a little bit of experimentation there. So, so if we say that that's where eventually we're going to try and get to, is, is robotics and, and automation, is that is that kind of an interim step that gives us some of the benefits you were talking about and is more straightforward, or, or does that just present different challenges? Um, I, I think it's an interim step for some aspects, but it's also the end step for others. You know, there, there's certain things that, that don't necessarily need an AI aspect to them. So, you know, you know, you you may have a repetitive known process that never changes that you want to automate. And then there's a process that will change over time that you need to learn and develop with. So, um, but I, I think the the key challenge is sort of going back to the story of, right, we, we, we understand that we want to make it better. We understand what our use case and our demand is. So how do we start on that technology build story to get to the end? And, and and that's something that we see a lot of our clients kind of struggling with is how do they move from what they've got to where they want to be? What What's the journey for them? Um, and, you know, even if you take Broadridge out of the equation or if you take FIS out of the equation, just say, right, the bank just runs their own technology shop. Well, they've got the same problem. So, you know, it, it's it's about then sort of saying, right, how do I build a team who understands what we need to do? How do I look at the platforms that I have today and make some hard decisions about do you keep them or do you get new ones? Or do you keep the legacy platform but have adapters that allow you to connect into them so you can start to go out to the outside world? Because, you know, there isn't, there's a finite amount of money available for investment. So it's about choosing the right things to invest in. And quite often you can, the, the biggest bang for buck that you can get is really about saying, well, if I build a component here that can get data out of this platform that I can then use in five different use cases, that, that's the best bang for buck for me. So it's really about trying to identify the technology that's required to get the data out there. And then these sort of modules that you want to bring in, um, whether it's an inter- external fintech or something that you build yourself around AI or automation, they can just grab that data from you. Because you've essentially got, you know, a component that sits in the middle that's got the older side on the left and the new fancy side on the right. And all you're doing is moving the data through that pipe. Um, and, and if we can, you know, help clients with that, that quite often really speeds up what they're doing. Go ahead. Sorry, right. I just, I'll just say that some of these things, you know, whether these are interim or thing, technology would always find something new, right? Like right now it is artificial intelligence or machine learning as we're calling it. Tomorrow, it may be quantum computing, right? It will be something else, right? Something else will continue to come on. But the fundamental thing which Darren touched upon is how do we understand what's the business case that I'm uh, targeting? And how do I make sure that I get to that business case with the investment that I need, which will give me the best return? And how can I technology, whether it is artificial intelligence or something else, can help me move there? And I think that's the biggest thing which are which any bank or our clients would continue to grab. That's not going to stop. I think that will continue to happen over a period of time, whether it's you know this technology or some other technology. And we have seen that happening the last 20 years and 20 years. Much of this industry runs on legacy technology. Mm-hmm. That is really so some of it is 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 actually about the mindset, right? And some of it is about how You know, if I can't, if my legacy systems are plugged into 17 internal systems, that's just, that's just, that's a hard lift, 
That's a hard thing to change. So what does that do to the technology infrastructure thinking and approach? Like what, what are the challenges? I think as you rightly touched upon, uh, right, that for a bank, it's a really, really hard decision, right? And I would say, I would actually question and say, do you really want to change your legacy system if they are fit for purpose, right? What you need, again, the need has to be defined. The need is that you want to provide a, a nice interface to your customers, millennia customers, or the need is to modernize your system. If, if the former is actual need, you can create uh, interfaces, so to speak, in technology uh, base, which will allow you an API gateways, which will allow you to get data out of your legacy system and do whatever you want to do, you know, any kind of visualization you want to put on it. And the same data can be used for an AI or machine learning algorithm. You don't really have to do that, right? If, if you have reached a point where your legacy system is not fit for purpose, that's a very, very different use case and you should look at it appropriately, but not for to caught up with the trend of creating an app, you know, which can be figured out in a very different way. And that's why I think an experienced partner is very, very useful to have, which can guide you through the process where they have worked with many such people who have been in that boat and help them to kind of, you know, implement the right decision, so to speak. And if you, if you look at like securities, Lending as an example of that. If you if you take a, a legacy platform that a bank built themselves, which did everything, it did settlements, it did corporate actions, it did billing. If you can say, well, I have to change my legacy platform because these things are all failing. I've got problems with billing, corporate actions. It's 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 not automated enough, etc. You've you've got two choices. You say, well, I'm going to replace everything in that platform, including all the trading and stuff, which works fine, but I have to or what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an interface that allows me to connect off to a corporate actions adapter that can look after that, that can set, that can connect off to a settlements platform that's built for purpose to do that and connect off to a billing system. Okay, so what you're then saying is, well, I can switch off these functionalities that are underperforming, replace them with an interface that's live or end of day, whatever it needs to be, um, and then you can get on with your business of plugging in those modules. And then because of the nature of the data that securities financing typically produces, it's really of three types. It's trade information, it's settlement information, or it's financial information like billing and valuations. If you can capture that three types of data coming out of the platform, you're pretty much done. You know, you've pretty much covered everything that you would ever need. If you've got trades, you can build positions. If you've got financial information, you can do uh, accounting, you can do billing. If you've got a uh, um, settlement-based information, you can do anything around recs, around pendings, etc. So, if if that can be captured off in some kind of API, you can start to plug in those modules, and you don't have to take that hard decision around replace a legacy platform. But like anything, the more that you eat from the big pie, eventually it becomes easier to swallow the last piece. So, you know, that's the way to do it: is to to do a full legacy lift out. Is, is difficult for people, but technologies now allow us to build in these APIs, take segments of that pie out, and eventually you're just left with a, a few pieces, which again, you can take out in a different way. And that's some of the tools that you probably saw in the banks that you wanted to plug in. And um, you know, that 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 was part of that that, that part. And if, if, if you think back about probably what, 12 years ago, 11 years ago, when Equilend really came along, that was seen as one of these, oh, how am I going to do it perspectives. But it's now part of that big pie because it's been integrated in. It's become part of the solution. So, you know, it's um, it, it's something that uh, over time more people are doing and they're, they're making it more standard to have these systems around that, 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 that do these things. So uh, and that's that's where you get value from technology spend. You know, the, the more you can invest in the interface layer, the more valuable it becomes to you because you can plug in more systems. So Vishal, shouldn't banks just shut down their IT departments and outsource everything to people like yourselves? I mean, what what value do they add if if there's solutions for all of this stuff? That's a very interesting question, actually, Roy. Um, I can tell Don't you. Don't answer it. <laughs> no, I'll just I'll not answer that. But I'll just tell you from my twenty years of experience. Uh, when I started my career, banks typically wanted to build a lot of technology which they thought was proprietary. 
right? They kind of, you know, they took pride in that and which was giving them a competitive edge. For the last 20 years, I think that mindset within the bank has shifted, I would not say change, right? A lot of things which they thought was needed, was proprietary, no longer is because think about it, right? A regulation changes and you have a huge thing that you have to build in that system. So I, I, I think banks are still investing in technologies, but technologies which gives them the edge. The other things, they are definitely looking at partners to outsource that because they don't think that provides any additional edge, for example, you know, a uh, settlement system. They don't think settlement system is, can be any different for anything. Maybe for a trading system, which is, you know, high frequency trading system, they would still invest, they would develop because it gives them an edge. So I think that's that there's a difference in mindset as to what it used to be and where we are right now. Does that qualify for an answer, Darren? Yeah, so, so I'll let Darren answer. But I think, I think in my, from my own perspective, I've always considered technology as a short-term competitive advantage, which then becomes a level playing field. And it's that continual process of we're going to improve something, then it's going to become standard. You know, and you can broaden out the the concept of technology. There was a time when having a Bloomberg terminal was a competitive advantage because mm-hmm. so few people had it. So to me, that's technology, even if all you were doing was punching into a, a dumb terminal effectively, right? So so technology is a very broad topic. Uh, and and I think it's I think it's interesting where you you're talking about people focusing on differentiators, because I think that that will always be the case. How can I take and and that's the value of of having standards. By having standards that everyone has to meet, you can then focus on the things that are beneficial because of your access, because of your attitude, because of your technology, because of the boxes you run it on, because of the people you, whatever it is, whatever you think your edge is, I don't want to compete on on settling my trades on time because that's not a competitive advantage, even though today it actually might be if I'm more efficient than my competition. Yeah, and I, I think like I totally agree with what you said. O- over time, what's cutting edge becomes standard. So it's like w- when you said about like should we just get rid of the technology teams? The instant thing I thought was get rid of them. That's crazy. Redevelop them is something that adds value. Redevelop them. Redevelop them to R and D that allows them allows you to do stuff that's really good that gives you that next advantage, whether it's in partnership or on your own. And it's not just about that as well. As if a, if a, an organization is doing research and development, or even a fintech like us doing research and development, guess what? You get the best people coming towards you. The best people give you what? The best output. So you have the cycle of, you know, if you're doing something cool, people want to come, then you get value from it. And then you're right, over time in five years, what they've done will become standard. So you do it again. So, you know, I, I would I would never see, like when we go into banks and we talk to them about, you know, we can replace these components with this. It's not about, okay, well, those people can then leave. It's how do we reuse them? How do we reuse the skills and knowledge that they've built up working in that bank to add value back to the bank? And that, that's the, the, the key mindset that, that orgs really need to have. Well, I always wanted my technology people to be the people that interpreted what I want wanted to have or what I wanted to do and go get the technology that did that for me, whether they developed it or whether they bought it in or how it, I don't really care. What I want is an outcome, not not. So the problem that they used to do is, oh, we can build that for you. That was just like the answer. It's like, how can you just do everything? Which is really interesting because you've never done it before, right? So you magically can do that. So 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 I think I think that's right. Uh, I would just I, just add to that. I think nowadays business has added one more layer to it. Not just that you can do it, but how can you give me a competitive advantage in the market, right? As you know, we touched upon earlier, then you know, whatever you're doing, would it help me either to gain more, you know, uh, get me more margin, right? Or it would help me to reduce any risk or it would improve efficiency. So they are looking at those factors. And when you take that into consideration, the choices definitely becomes much more and you know, a little bit more difficult for the technology, whether to do it on their own or to you know, go along with the partner. And and is that still is that still a debate? on per development project, build it versus buy it? Is that still part of every uh, process? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so, yeah, because, well, you know, people are people. You know, they, they, there's a, an element of 
especially in technology people, there's an element of, I can do this. I can do this the best. Um, what other people have isn't as good as what I could do. So there's definitely that element of it. But you know, when, it, when it comes down to a, a good, the, the type of people that you talked about, the technology people that you want to have, those people are kind of look beyond that and say, well, I, I know we could do it, but it'll take us 12 months and there's a lot of risk in there. Or there's something I, I know I can implement in three months and it's a working solution. So, you know, th there there's definitely those discussions against buy and build. And then I would say partner is something that's there more than ever. So which firm can I partner with that can give me the, out the outcome that I'm looking for? You know, whether it's a small fintech, whether it's a big company like Broadridge, how can I partner with someone and we can do it jointly? Because, you know, it's, it's something sometimes, you know, it's about how many people do you have? Other times it's about the experience that you've got. Other times it's about the underlying infrastructure that's available. You know, at the moment, as an example, it's very hard to buy new laptops just now because of the pandemic. There's a shortage of equipment to build new laptops. So if you want to scale up your business and add in a new data um, center, it's going to be pretty hard at the moment. So you are going to have to partner with other organizations who have that scale already available. It's a, 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 a sort of a crude example, but it's the truth. Sometimes you can't do what you want to do on your own. You need help. And then um, we see that more often, especially with um, firms that can just drop in and help with that partnership and they can give you components that are already there that you can plug into your system. So, you know, uh, that's that's one difference I see with the build or buy. You've got this third rationale now. What is part? Look, I'm always skeptical of words like partnership because it's one of those easy words for people to use. So, what does partnership look like in the kind of scenario that you just uh, outlined? Um, I, well, you know, when it, I guess it's you've got you've still got a vendor relationship for sure. So you're still buying something, but you're not necessarily buying everything. You're buying pieces from different people to bring it together, um, and you're perhaps buying some of the more complex pieces from the vendors and building some of the simple stuff yourself. You're perhaps saying, well, I think both of you have actually said it. What, what's special about what I want and do I want to retain that IP myself? Do I want to build that aspect of my own and then use something uh, more standard for some other processes? Or the AI that I want to build well, I know there's tools out there I can use, so I'm going to use the partner to help me configure that AI. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's all about just bringing in people from uh, the, the outside world that you can use. And it may well just be on a short-term basis. It may be on a vendor relationship basis where you're renting services from them. It just may be a consultancy basis. But, you know, we see that more and more that, that the orgs are bringing those people in to help. And just to and, and uh, I, I have yeah, to talk about what's the difference, you know, just to touch on what's the difference in my opinion, a partner and a vendor is that relationship. You know, I think that's a very, very important thing. Uh, a partner kind of helps to not just sell you the solution, but helps you to kind of make sure that there is a buy-in for that solution within the organization. Something a vendor, you know, if you go buy, you know, buy something, some product from the shelf, that's a vendor, you know, just going there, buying there. But when a partner comes in, they help you to get that solution implemented within the organization. And whatever it you know it takes in terms of training your people, partnering with people, creating that mindset, changing that mindset, partner kind of helps you in all those things. And I think that's that's the key differentiator. The, I think that's exactly the point why I quite like agile because if you're actually interacting with people all the time, you actually develop a relationship. And because you're not spending the big ticket all at once and they've got it signed off and they know they're going to collect the money, they have an interest in continuing to help you develop the uh, the program and the implementation. And so to me, it's a much closer relationship. It might still be a vendor-client relationship, but it is it is much, much closer. So so that's a, a well-made point, Vishal. Um, I, one of the things, though, that is always a challenge is, and we've all talked about it, this is a people business. So, you know, I gave a speech a few years ago in, in Hong Kong where uh, the subject matter they asked me to talk about was, uh, should traders worry about their jobs because of AI? Um, and I think that sort of extended out as we've seen more in the robotic space and the operational processes you talked about. Uh, reconciliations, Darren, on, on the AI side. Um, 
And if we talk about you know disruptive technology providers from bigger, large firms, uh, bigger, small firms, uh, all of that changes sort of the human dynamics and the jobs. And, and look, the, the summary of my speech was, if all you do is get a phone call and make a phone call and book a ticket, you're already in trouble. Right, so so you need to find ways to solve problems and add value and look for benefits and 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 improve processes. Uh, and if you do that, then you'll adapt and change as as time goes on. But but the, do, to what extent do you think that the human sort of psyche of of clients and and sort of parts of clients, so the implementation teams, the decision makers, the influencers, how much of that is is changing in their own minds in terms of making the decision to apply more automation in whatever form uh, that it that it takes. I think you used a really good word there, influencer. So uh, quite a modern word as well, Roy. I'm impressed. Um, so, like, I, I think there needs to be well, the, 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 there's there's the you know, ideally you would say we're, we're never going to reduce headcount. That's that. Of course, that's what everyone wants. But the reality is that everywhere is always looking for some form of savings reduction. Um, but what you know, as you said, if if all you're doing is something simple, you're already in trouble. So you know, the good people will always stay. You will always then be able to use those for adding value back in. So I think if if there's a mindset within the project team or the business team at the start of of, of a journey. That you know, at, by the end, we want to have done certain things. You know, it, it's it's important that they stick to that and they have good reasons for that. You know, it, it's not. I, I don't think an outcome of AI or robotics is for people to no longer have a job. I, I think an outcome from AI and robotics is that you free people up to add value back to the business, and you know that that's what we should be aiming for because that that those automation points doesn't just save you money in people. It saves you money in operational risk. It saves you uh, how much money the organizations spend having to firefight their way out of problems, even on the ops side. How much wasted time is it they're looking into doing things? Think of that as a factor. It's, it's massive. If you can remove that from the business and but still keep the people, you're still saving a ton of money. So, you know, organizations have to think about the way that they're putting things in place is, the outcome is people will have freed up time that we can then use to add value. I don't know how many times I've been in an org and we can't do something new because we don't have the people. You know, how many times do you hear that? Like all the time. It, well, free the people up and you can do new stuff. So it's a natural outcome from automation as you free people up that you can then do the things that you now can't do. Or, you know, how many times have I heard we want to do something, but we don't have the people, so we have to go and get more budget. We don't have to get budget anymore. Free up the people. It's the same budget, you know. So it's just a mindset thing. And and if the managers can get into that and that can be passed down to the delivery teams and everyone can understand the outcome at the trading desk level, at the the uh, the operations level of what, what we're trying to achieve as a business is not reduce our headcount. It's free you guys up to do all the new cool stuff we've talked about for the last five years and never done. You know, and, and that, that's, that's what you have to get into with this. So just yeah, to add to that, Oh. I can bore, I can bore you with fifteen stories along those lines, but I I couldn't agree more, and it would definitely be boring. Uh, Vishal, you wanted to add something? No, I think uh, just to add to what Darren is saying, essentially, is that what AI and ML allows you is to reduce waste, which has in, you know which has which you have built up over a period of time. When when you reduce that waste, you basically free up I would simply say capital, right? Whether it is human capital or cost. And then you can redeploy that capital in a much more effective way. And business would definitely find a way to redeploy that. And that redeployment means that people, as you rightly said, are people who are doing repeated manual tasks, are they happy doing that and you know, creating you know, errors, risk to the business? Or are they better be done by some kind of a automated process? And then people can then be freed up to use their cognitive skills and the relationship skills that we generally are much more powerful about. AI hasn't really reached that level yet, right? To really, you know, do something which adds value to the business. So it's reducing the waste, using that capital to redeploy it in a much better way. And I really agree with Darren completely that it would should not really reduce in reduction of people, but just a redeployment in a much better place. 
Well, the the reality is there are some people that, that like doing mundane, repetitive tasks every day. And I think with every every technological change of of era, you have people that are casualties of that. So we shouldn't we shouldn't discount the fact that some people that do just box ticking are you know at risk, just like this stock loan trader who gets a call, makes a call, and books a spread. That. The, the, there is a limit as to how much value that uh, that has as a standalone product, right? Uh, I'm wondering if you have any sort of uh, closing thoughts on on what the client priorities are over the one, two, three years, and maybe what the what the risks are, what you think that they should be worried about and concentrating on or investigating further. Like, just give some guidance to technology buyers and users, maybe. Yeah, sure. I'll. I'll- I sort of answer that. So, so I, th- I think the the sort of one, two, and three year cycles are, are probably a little bit short. So let's just call it one, three, and five. So even though Vishal says technology evolves very quickly, which it does, you know, we tend to look in things of like windows of like one year, three years, five years, and and working backwards, five years is what are the innovators doing just now what's coming along what what what's happening in the, the the innovation world that will start streaming its way into banking and how how do i start going into partnerships with those so that's something that technology buyers should be thinking about looking at the big the big big picture looking out five years what's coming along whether it's infrastructure whether it's technology whether it's you know different um software uh techniques etc because that will eventually drip into banking so getting themselves involved in that early doors allows for that early adoption. It allows for them to be at that, not the bleeding edge or the cutting edge, but just being thereafter. And so I would I would say that's something uh, for, for sure to look at. Probably three years from now, I would imagine that personally AI will be heavily embedded in banking. Um, it will be probably heavily embedded in front to back as well, um, or should be. Um, whether some organizations truly adopt it or not is, is, is wait to see. But things like AI and digital digitalization and data, I would use the word big data again, but it's probably a step too far. But bringing data all together into one place, a data lake that can then be used, is probably definitely the, the three-year view that most organizations will be looking at. They'll either be on the journey already, might be a little bit further down the path. Some of them might even think they're finished, but I'm sure there's still more to come and others are still very early on at that adoption. And I would say that the one year cycle for everyone um, is really, I, I think the, the the world is still to probably go through a bit of a recession, let's be honest. So you would imagine that there's still some challenges to come around uh, people, around client service. And I think organizations focus at the moment, certainly a lot of our customers is, How do they get new products out there as quickly as possible for bringing in that extra revenue? How do they service their clients well and look after them well because they don't want to lose clients? They want to gain them. And then how do they look after their staff? You know, how do they ensure that their staff are invigorated, that are enjoying what they do? Um, And technology plays a part in that. You might not think so, but it does. Going back to what you said, how can I take a boring, mundane job away from someone to bring in something that's better for them to do? How can I free up their capital? And I, I think there's a, a there's definitely still, because of the pandemic, there's obvious uh, waves in different countries, uh, but there's obvious mental health issues everywhere as well. So it's ensuring that you're not losing staff. You know, could you imagine losing 25% of the staff that you had when you worked at HSBC? Could you imagine the impact of your business that would have had? It's huge. So, you know, that could happen over the next year because of the fact that your business is now all over the world. So you've got offices in Asia, you've got offices in the Middle East, you've got offices in Europe. You just lose one individual from each of those places and then you've lost a big part of your team. So it's how do you ensure, so banks really are focused on how do they use technology to help people, whether it's collaboration technology, whether it's technology in the jobs that they're, they're doing, whether it's systems where it's new things are bringing in so that's definitely the one year view for personally for me is how do you ensure that we use the technology that we have now to the best of our abilities to to do little things quickly to add value 
And it, you know, it's uh, and unfortunately, it's the world we live in. But I think it's it's something that we're all focused on. Vishal, anything you want to add um, to that? I will probably go with two things, which I believe are uh, very immediate, or rather, the one which is very immediate, and that is, it, we started with the the world is a connected place. And I think the technology adoption and adoption of systems is very different in in some of the you know European versus Asian and you know Middle Eastern thing. What this pandemic has really done is challenge those assumptions. And you know, um, for example, I mean, I we know that some of our clients were very very manual in Japan. Now with this pandemic, they cannot no longer afford so. While their mindset was very different before the pandemic, it has changed over a period of time. So we will see a lot more of, of digitization and automation focus coming in from, from some of these places than maybe you know Europe and Americas, which is much more technology advanced and you know they're almost there. Right? I think that's going to be one trend which we'll hopefully see in the next uh, year or so. We are already seeing kind of uh, part of it. The other thing, in my opinion, is going to be around products, um, which is how do we create products which satisfies a millennia? And that would really kind of underpin, the technology is going to underpin all of that creation of new products. I think the demand that they have is very, very different. And as they are becoming, you know, uh, they are already there in the system. So to be able to meet those demands, which is always on system without any uh, error, something which can get immediate response, would banks and all, everybody, you know, not just banks and asset managers, everybody has to really look at their technology in a very, very different way. So that, in, in my opinion, is going to be three to five years, and that's where AI, ML, cloud, all these things are going to be very, very integral part of their technology portfolio if they are not already. Right. Well, look, I think that uh, to me that sounds like a much more fun place to work, uh, where environment to work in. So, uh, so that's a, a great place to uh, to to finish. I probably won't be working then. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I will be working, or hopefully I won't be. I'm not sure which I feel. Um, but look, th- thanks very much for that, guys. I, I think that was uh, some really fascinating insights, and and I certainly learned a lot. So appreciate your time, and thanks very much. Thanks, Roy. Thank you, Roy. Before I get to the, my summary of the show, what I want to do is make a quick pitch. This show is brought to you by Pierpoint Financial, where we make a ton of free content available on securities finance. In addition to these podcasts, we also do a weekly blog. We do twice weekly um, live streams on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And we also provide free primers as well as our our paid for courses. Uh, But this, of course, costs time and money. And if you find the content helpful and want the shows to remain ad free, then we need your help. And by help, I mean, I'd like you to buy me a coffee at our buy me a coffee uh, page. And there'll be uh, details in the uh, show description. Look, a a simple one-off donation is really super appreciated and helpful. And we also have monthly recurring memberships with different benefits, uh, including access to one of our monthly Q&A sessions for exclusive members only. I drink a lot of coffee, and I'd appreciate it if you buy me one. As I said, the link is in the show description. Now let's get back to the summary. So I found that discussion with Darren and Agrawal incredibly enlightening, and I hope you did too. Uh, Darren, I think, as you see, is a master at drawing analogies. Uh, I think his house example when discussing Agile is spot on, and the eating a big pie while replacing uh, legacy systems, frankly, is what I'm going to steal, I think, and use myself. Uh, Both Darren and Vishal gave us insights into technology decision-making and the factors that are influencing buyer behaviors uh, and a shift in the perpetual debate of buy versus build. Darren took us through a better way to think about redeploying technology staff that may have their current roles changed through different technology build approaches. And Vishal took us down the path of continuous evolution of demand drivers. So suggesting that maybe even after we've mastered uh, AI and machine learning, we'll move into quantum computing 
uh, as part of our future. Uh, the episode finished with Darren's excellent overview of the next one, three, and five years, or maybe I should say the next five, three, and one year. And Vishal left us with changes in regional firms thinking towards digitization and automation uh, as a result of COVID and how the creation of new products in future will change and not only uh, require, but really embrace uh, automation, AI, and machine learning. So that's my summary for an excellent start to the series. As always, we encourage you to share topics or guests that you'd like to hear from. So drop me a line at Roy at PeerPoint.info, or if you're watching on video, you can always leave comments and we'll respond there. Uh, our contact details are in the show notes, as well as links for Darren and Vishal, as I said. Uh, the free securities finance content, which I mentioned earlier, can be found at our website, www.peerpoint.info. We're uh, incredibly active on LinkedIn and, uh, and sometimes on Facebook as PeerPoint Financial Consulting and on Twitter as PeerPoint FC. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel. This has been PeerPoint Perspectives, the art of securities finance, and I look forward to catching you next time. <laughs>